agreed to come to UK and tell us about our work at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Please join me in welcoming my good friend Elizabeth Warren to the University of Kentucky. delighted to be here. Uh, uh, it, is, it is amazing for so many people to spend uh, such a lovely evening inside. Uh, and I am grateful for your showing up and hope we can make this uh, a lively and interesting evening. Uh, I want to thank the Dean. I want to thank Ken for your warm hospitality. Uh, I also, now that I know that you may get paid for this in a bottle of bourbon, uh, want my cut. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm nobody's fool. So what I want to do, ah, good, this is going to work. What I want to do uh, this evening is I want to talk with you just a little bit about some data and just a little bit about some public policy and see if maybe out of that we get some kind of lively and interesting discussion. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm, whoop, I'm going to turn the whole thing off. Let me, let me see if I'm, ah, there we go. So here's sort of the thesis of, of what I'm going to talk about tonight. And that is that within one generation, the economics of the middle class in America has fundamentally shifted. And what I want to do is I want to talk about how it's changed. And then I want to talk a little bit about something that's very current for me and very important for me. And that is how that fits into this new consumer agency that we're trying to build in Washington. I, I want to be careful as I do this like all good careful academics. I want to talk about some data about things that are. And there are places where you may want to draw causal inferences. And I think sometimes we can do that and we can talk about that near the end. But by and large, it's hard to know which way the causal arrows run in this. And like all good empiricists, uh, never wanting to overclaim that. So let me just talk about some data and about what they look like and what they might tell us about how the world has changed. So where this story, story starts, it starts with when we first start getting some good data about um, single men's earnings, how much a man in the United States earns. And by the way, all the numbers I'll do up here are going to be adjusted for inflation, so you don't have to adjust for that. They're all in constant $2010, so you can play this out. And here's how the story goes. This is from 1955, which is when we first pick up the first post-war good data on this. And it goes through 1973, and you can see that what's happening is year over year that men are making more money, uh, that they are getting ever more uh, uh, income. And that what happens is that married couples, that's the line above, the blue line, is keeping pace with that. So married couples are earning more because men are earning more. These are mostly one earner families. You notice that, by the way, the income line is a little higher for married couples. These are all median incomes. Why does that happen? Well, it actually turns out that married men make a little more money than single men do. So when you mix married and single together, you get a little lower median income. Why? That's partly because you cut out the youngest men who have entered the labor force and therefore have lower wages. Uh, it's also the case that uh, uh, married men are slightly better educated, uh, particularly during this time period. And who knows, uh, uh, maybe with a spouse they work harder for whatever reasons they seem to do a little better on the earnings front. Okay, so that's what the world looks like up until the early 1970s. And then something happens in around 1973. And that is, this is still a male, a fully employed male, and we're only comparing fully employed to fully employed here. A fully employed male's wages just flatten out. And they stay flat all the way on through the present, effectively, statistically speaking. In fact, I put the peak there in 1973 in today's dollars. A fully employed male was making about $49,485. And a fully employed male today is making about $49,164. In other words, about $321 less than his father was making a generation ago. So what happened to married couples? Well, married couples, actually kept the growth line up, although you notice it's ragged, but they kept the growth line up. How did they keep the growth line up? We all know the answer to that. They started sending more people into the workforce. And they kept doing it over time, median kept rising. Um, this is the result of the shift 
that took place over one generation, from being a one-income family to being a two-income family. Now, the consequence of this, though, notice the difference. It's not only that one kept rising and then one flattened out. The difference back in 1955 between what married couples at the median were earning and what a single employed male was earning was about $2,500 in today's dollars. The difference by the time you reach 2009 is $22,500. So notice a much, much bigger gap. And that brings me to the first conclusion here. And that is, how have household finances changed significantly? Well, the first one is the income composition shifted. So every time from now on, you're reading the New York Times and you see one of these things that says household income and household income has continued to go up. Remember, it continued to go up for two very different reasons. Before the early 1970s, it went up because a fully employed male earned a lot more money. After the 1970s, it went up only if they could put two people into the workforce. Now, why would that composition matter, the shift in the composition? As long as income goes up, why would anybody care? Well, let me just throw out two or three ideas you might want to think about. One is a cost idea. Um, how much does it cost to produce one income versus how much does it cost to produce two incomes? That is, if this is a couple, for example, with children, childcare now has to enter the equation in order to produce that continually rising income. Uh, transportation costs, lunches, clothes, all the things that go into putting two people into the workforce. It also changes the risk composition of the family. Um, that family that we were looking at a minute ago, up on the blue line, has a very different risk composition by the time you get to 2000s than it had back in the 19, early 1970s. And that is they've lost the backup worker. Uh, what's known as the added worker effect. So one of the things that labor economists have studied for a long time is that when the primary worker is out of work, what's one of the consequences? And that is the backup worker, if it's a married couple, goes into the workforce. Uh, the result of that is that, well, with a combination of unemployment and a second income, you've at least got a chance. The dip is not quite so low. And the possibility that the second worker can stay in the workforce a little bit longer and sort of over earn to make up for the fact that there was a period of dip. That's obviously lost when they're both, you've already put everybody into the workforce, there's no added worker to put in. You also lose other kinds of contributions if you're thinking about the risk profile that a spouse typically provided. So for example, what happens when grandma gets sick, uh, when she falls and breaks a hip? Well, back at that one income family, there was someone home to take care of her. There was someone to be able to take her to the doctor and make sure that she got care and to provide uh, that additional care. When they're both in the workforce full time, when that other member of the family gets sick, one of the consequences turns out to be that it has either an income impact, that is somebody's got to quit work in order to be able to take care of this other person in the family, or an expense impact, that is you've got to hire somebody to be able to come in and and take care during that time period. Same sort of thing when we're talking about children who are sick. And of course, what makes this particularly cute is to watch the time period. These occur at the very same time that one way that we accomplish savings in the healthcare field is to change how long people stay in the hospital.